It's the SNL Hall of Fame Podcast. With your host, Jamie Dew. Chief Librarian, Thomas Senna. And featuring Matt Ardill. of the hall, Jamie Dew. All right. Thank you so much, Doug Donat. It is great to be here in the SNL Hall of Fame podcast zone. Please come on inside. But before you do, wipe that spring muck off your feet. The SNL Hall of Fame podcast is a weekly affair. Each episode, we take a deep dive into the career of a former cast member, host, musical guest, or writer, and add them to the ballot for your consideration. Once the nominees have all been announced, we turn to you, the listener, to vote for the most deserving and help determine who will be enshrined for perpetuity in the hall. Folks, it's time. It's absolutely time. The time has come. May 23rd is tomorrow, and voting opens up. Have you registered to vote? Go to snlhof.com, click vote, and click register to vote there. Your ballot will be in your hands within 24 hours once the 23rd begins, and uh, all bets are off. We're going to elect another class in the SNL Hall of Fame. So this is really exciting. And what makes things even more exciting is today's nominee, because if you had your ballot set, it might be thrown asunder when you hear who we are nominating today, and that is Amy Poehler. We are closing out this season by nominating Amy Poehler. Uh, This is going to be great. I can't wait to hear what our guest has to say, and uh, really, I can't wait to hear what Matt has to say. So let's go and talk to our friend Matt. Hey, Matt. Hey, Jamie. How are you doing? I'm great. How about you, Matt? I am terrific. I'm really looking forward to today's uh, topic of discussion, uh, Amy Poehler. Yeah, she's great, right? She is wonderful. Uh, Five foot two, born September 16th, 1971. So we're starting to get into the cast members that are around my age and making me feel old since they're already retired from SNL. Um, She has 94 acting credits, 30 producer credits, 19 writing credits, 15 soundtrack credits, and six director credits. Um, Yeah, she was born in Newton, Massachusetts, to two school teachers. Her dad pushed her from day one to try new things. Uh, Prior to going to college, she worked in an old-timey themed ice cream parlor uh, called Chadwick's, where she was made to wear a a costume and play the kazoo (laughs) while singing Happy Birthday to customers. Uh, And that's actually what helped her realize that she wanted to be a performer because making people laugh made her feel like a queen. Um, yeah, so she started improv uh, with a troupe, My Mother's Flea Bag, while working on her bachelor's in media at Boston College. Uh, she took uh, classes at Second City, where she studied with improv god Del Close. Wow. Uh, there's so many people I know who are like one degree separated from Del Close. It's bonkers. And it's like, man, it must have been wild studying with him. But uh, yeah, so while studying uh, with Del, she befriended and began performing alongside Tina Fey at Improv Olympics. Um, and she then went on to co-found Upright Citizens Brigade and helped create the ASCAT format uh, with Matt Besser, Ian Roberts, and Matt Walsh. Uh, In 1996, growing from just an improv sketch troupe to a school of its own, sitting side-by-side with Second City and the Groundlings as one of the most influential improv sketch schools in in entertainment, Um, UCB went on to train luminaries like Aziz Ansari, Donald Glover, Ed Helms, Ellie Kemper, Aubrey Plaza, Nick Kroll, and Zach Woods. Uh, Basically, if you see a hot young comedian who's actually no longer that young but still hot, uh, ripping up the industry right (laughs) now, um, they likely took a UCB class. Um, Now, she is, like my wife, a noted fan of Bones, Thugs, and Harmony. Um, 
In the early 90s, she had a recurring role on Conan O'Brien's Late Night as Andy Richter's younger sister with a disturbingly intense crush on Conan. Um, it, was, it, was, it was a lot to watch even back then. Uh, she brought it all. Um, now, during the first two seasons of Arrested Development, uh, she played Will Arnett, Gob Bluth's accidental wife, uh, before eventually marrying him for real in 2007, uh, before later divorcing. Uh, she also played his sister in the film's Blades of Glory with a disturbingly wife-like energy. Um, now, <laughs> while filming the, the movie Baby Mama with Tina Fey, she was, in fact, pregnant with her first child, Archie. Uh, she has formed lasting friendships with both Faye Seth, and Seth Meyers, whom she considers her best friends. Uh, she has a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, along with a Golden Globe for Best Performing Performance by an Actress in Television. She has a sure. star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, along with a Golden Globe for Best Performance by an Actress in a Television Series for Parks and Rec, as well as an Emmy and Writers Guild of America Award. Was the third SNL alumni to give a class day address to the graduating class at Harvard, uh, alongside Al Franken and Will Ferrell. Uh, she started a wine store called Zula Wines and Spirits in Brooklyn Park Slope with musician friends Amy Miles and Mike Robertson, where they sell nice bottles of wine for as little as $13. Uh, and finally, during the filming of Parks and Rec, uh, Polar started a tradition that any time the show was shot on location, the whole cast would, and crew would have dinner together, and she would dedicate a toast to someone, often picking out a cast or crew member, and the toasts would have to continue until everyone was toasted. Uh, Mike Schur called this the Polar, and continued this tradition on, on The Good Place. So yeah, she's a, just a nice human being. Sounds that way. Yeah. Nice human being who belongs in the SNL Hall of Fame. What do you think? Agreed. Definitely agreed. All right. Cool. Yes, thank you so much, Matt and Jamie, and I am to join here today by a wonderful first-time guest here on the SNL Hall of Fame. She's a frequent guest on the Saturday Night Networks podcast, our uh, great friends over there, John Schneider and them. Victoria, I, I actually heard you on John's shows and decided to poach you. That's kind of what, what I do <laughs> here and there, is I'll hear talent on, on the Saturday Night Network and then just kind of get you over here on the SNL Hall of Fame, but John doesn't mind. So No, <laughs> I'm sure he doesn't mind the double dip. <laughs> no, no, he does not. We are, we are all good friends. We're all a wonderful podcasting community. So Victoria Franzo, thank you so much for joining us here on the SNL of Hall of Fame. And thank you for having me. I'm excited to do this. Uh, I love debating Hall of Fame people and who's worthy and who may not be worthy, but we're here to discuss who's worthy. <laughs> yes, ab yeah, absolutely. And we get we have a really good one today. But we before we get to that, usually I go into more detail about my guest during this intro. But I want you to do it, Victoria. So can you talk about your experience as a sketch and improv performer, and maybe a little about being a 2023 SNL scholar? Yeah, I'd love to. So I've always wanted to do comedy. It was kind of second nature, but my parents always told me to, quote, get a real job, as a lot of performer parents tell them to do. So after college, probably around 2018, I started taking improv classes at the Second City and did a lot of performances there as well outside of my classes. And then in 2020, I auditioned for the conservatory, which I'll just pair like just for context, is kind of like your masters of of comedy and improv at the Second City. You have to audition to get in, and you have to audition to stay in. And then something called the pan pandemic is what it was called happened. Mm, uh, I've heard read, about that. Yeah, I read about it on Twitter, and it was like, ugh, it was a big deal or something. So I had to pause 
there, pause there for a little bit, but last year while living in Detroit, I was doing comedy at Go Comedy Impro- Impro- Improv Theater. I don't know why I keep, <laughs> I can't say improv for the life of me, even though I do it all the time. I was doing comedy there. I was an understudy. I did a couple sketch shows or a sketch show at the Planet Ant Theater, both theaters founded by Second City Detroit alumni, which is really cool. So you kind of get that training trickle down. And then last year I applied for the Saturday Night Live scholarship at the Second City and was one out of four people who got it, which is really cool. It's a diversity scholarship and it kind of is trying to build a pathway for folks who have a different background, whether that be, you know, ethnically, racial, you know, if they're part of the LGBTQ plus community, just to get them an opportunity to be in spaces that they may otherwise not have. And what that entails is, you know, they pay for my training and what my classes are. And I'm currently in the final stage of my classes at Second City. So it's kind of bittersweet there. But then, you know, I get to meet with a few SNL folks and then hopefully get to audition uh, this time next year. Wow, that, so, that's that's awesome, and hopefully you won't forget all of us little people who no. you've interacted with when you're on when you're on the show in New York <laughs> doing that. That's but that's oh, Victoria. That's so awesome, and yeah. I, I just kind of wish you wish you really good luck and wish you well on your on your uh, venture there. That's so wonderful. Thank you so much. I don't expect anything. I'll be very honest. Yeah. I don't expect to be on SNL. Like, you know, I'm. I'm really just grateful to be doing this work. It's a, it's been a part of my life for such a long time. And now that I'm able to kind of learn from the best and learn all these different techniques, whether or not I make a test in L or whatever it is that I end up doing, I'm just happy to be doing it. And, you know, even being on podcasts like this one and just to share my love for comedy in, in different ways is, is awesome. You bring such a great perspective that we haven't had. Uh, here on the SNL Hall of Fame. Uh, You're not just watching Saturday Night Live and watching sketch performers. You're doing it. You're performing Mm -hmm. sketch. You're taking the classes. You're making your way through. So I just love that perspective that you bring to this. So that's why, you know, I think you're the perfect guest to talk about Amy Poehler because she was so influential in the sketch Mm -hmm. and improv world. So uh, her first sketch and improv experience, just real quick, was with Improv Olympic. So can you yes. tell us kind of about Improv Olympic and what, you know, what Amy's background is with that? Yeah, I, I don't know entirely too much about her time at IO is what it's is called. But I do know her first class was taught by Sharna Halpern, who is an icon and a staple in the Chicago improv community and just improv like improv everywhere. And so to have your first class in Chicago taught by her is kind of a big deal. You don't see it often. I don't think Sean is teaching much anymore. She also learned and worked from uh, Del Close, who's also a legend in the comedy world uh, and Chicago and improv as well. And that's actually where she met Tina Fey. So a lot of folks think she met her at Second City, but I think it was actually I.O. where where they met. And then then they moved on to Second City. But yeah, others at I.O., just to name a few, was, you know, like Chris Farley was there. And so it's a uh, that institution among, you know, Second City or where they've built a lot of these great SNL cast members. Yeah, the roots of sketch and improv definitely go back to like IO and Del Close, yes. especially Del Close is one of those names that you hear. It's almost like hearing about if you're a baseball fan, like Babe Ruth or yes. something like that, that just the name Del Close rings like that uh, amongst these circles. I was going to say, if you're a fan of improv and sketch and learning about, you know, where it all started, I highly recommend reading the book called Improv Nation. And it goes a little bit deeper if you're a little nerd about it like me. It goes a bit, a bit, a lot deeper into, into it. And it talks about, you know, how Chicago has become this, for lack of a better term, a cesspool of like comedic geniuses. And, you know, that's where everyone comes to, to, you know, really get their foot in the door. I think that book uh, it delved did it delve in a little bit into Mike Nichols and maybe mm-hmm. his work and too and yeah everybody yeah. knows Mike Nichols from his from his uh, time as a director a really famous director but he has roots mm-hmm. there uh, yeah. yeah Improv Nation is a really good book I I, I second that I suggest Improv <laughs> Nation as well uh, so yeah so Amy Poehler joined uh, in 1995 she then moved on to Upright Citizens Brigade where I think yes. most people who caught the me the tail end are familiar with her before SNL, they know her with UCB. 
So she co-founded the UCB Theater in New York City in 1999. That's one of the main training grounds for aspiring and sketch improv and comedians like Second City and those others, Mm -hmm. the Groundlings in 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 California and LA. These are like the huge breeding grounds for sketch and improv performers. So Victoria, as someone who's currently a sketch and improv comedian, I know you're most associated with Second City, but you know, we can put into context uh, UCB standing in that world of sketch. So maybe let me tell us about UCB's standing in that world and p- particularly Amy's influence. Yeah, I just take a step back to I want to call out that Amy Poehler was on Second City's touring company, which has been part of Second City since I think 1967. And it was a way for if you weren't able to make it a second city, second city was going to come to you and not many people are able to do that. So I just want to call out how awesome it is and how, you know, seldom it is that you get to see folks on touring company. It's very competitive. Former touring members include like Julia Louis Dreyfus uh, and Chris Red, and they, her and Tina Fey actually auditioned on the same day and got to tour together, which is really cool. But uh, UCB, I think it was, she founded in 1996 with Matt Welsh, who you may know as like the doctor from The Hangover. Mm-hmm. If anyone. If Veep, <laughs> like, he, yeah, he yes, played a huge yeah. role in Veep, yeah. Yeah, he's he's awesome. He's so underrated, but we'll we'll talk about him another time, <laughs> uh, among a few others. And they, you know, really found their footing in New York City, and that's where they really created a foundation. Um, you know, they made appearances with back then was called Late Night with Conan O'Brien, uh, and they played like some characters in the audience. You've seen that, and also like Late Night with Jimmy Fallon, and and all that, where they sit among the audience. Uh, they also had a show on Comedy Central, which is really cool. And it was improv-driven sketches, like hidden camera stunts. And most notable, I think, is what was called the the prostitute barista, where she's this like former prostitute who goes and interviews at a coffee shop. And Matt Welsh, we just talked about, is is the hiring manager is like, I don't think you're qualified. And it's very funny. And then they end up being best friends and he ends up following his dream. It was was really funny. Uh, And then eventually she was one of the co-founders of UCB Theater in New York. And I think they also had it in LA, which unfortunately closed during the pandemic, but is reportedly back. I, uh, I'm going to describe a moment where I kind of like, you know, people peak in high school. Yeah. I peaked, I peaked in this moment and then it's been downhill since it's it's been stagnant, (laughs) downhill (laughs) and stagnant a little bit, but, uh, March, 2020, right before, like literally two weeks before the world shut down, I went to New York city and I was standing outside SNL at the, what's it called? The just outside where folks can meet the the cast members after the show and Chris Red, who I've seen numerous times previously in Chicago recognized me and said, Oh, Hey, Victoria, how are you? And, uh, he said, are you here on Monday? Which I was Monday was actually March 2nd was my birthday. And he goes, Hey, come to UCB. Me and Ego are doing an improv show. I was like, uh, okay. And got tickets. We went and that was my first time at UCB. It was really fun. They did this cool little, they were, I love the format of it. I won't spoil it just in case they're they're doing it again. But they basically are doing, they ask questions or they do a little bit at the beginning and then it turns into an actual scene. Uh, and then afterward, I got to talk to him a little bit and meet Ego Nuotum. And that was my birthday and that was the best birthday I ever had. Wow. Yeah. And yeah, I peaked. And I'll never <laughs> well, get you cooler. got, I mean the personal invite from Chris Red for one mm-hmm. you didn't you, it's not like you went to the show as a fan and then you happened to meet them afterward like you you right. got the personal invite so yeah i would that would be damn near the peak for me too <laughs> yeah so and i mean it was just it was a very it's a very cool theater if you're in new york city i highly recommend you go and check it out it's you can tell like the comedy and the genius that is amy poehler and you know why she's an awesome contender for a hall of fame spot uh just kind of flows through that space and She's definitely inspired me. Her and Tina Fey, when I was younger, always inspired me. Uh, Gilda Radner, of course, but you know, for my generation, the folks that I, the women I looked up to, were those two. And it was because of them I even signed up for my first Second City class. And you know, here we are today, a few yeah. years later. But yeah, so she's she's definitely an inspiration for you and mm-hmm. and a lot of people. And I find what I, one of the things that I find fascinating about her, um, as it relates to her time before SNL 
was you you had mentioned the the Upright Citizens Brigade Brigade sketch show that was on Comedy mm-hmm. Central. So that ran yeah. for three seasons. Um, it was with the aforementioned Matt Walsh, Matt Besser, and Ian Roberts. Uh, mm-hmm. Also made up the UCB, and it's interesting because she's one of the few, one of the handful of people who get to SNL who did sketch on television before that. So of course, like we had Keenan Thompson had sketched experience on TV. Taryn mm-hmm. Killam, uh, I believe, yep. was on Mad TV before SNL. Kate McKinnon uh, yeah. was known for for um, being on a sketch show. Uh, so, but Amy was like that too. And I'd watched mm-hmm. uh, Upright Citizens Brigade on Comedy Central as it was airing. And That's so cool. Yeah, it was so it was awesome. It was like a spiritual successor, I would say, to Kids in the Hall. It kind of had that weird yeah. out there Kids in the Hall vibe. Um, yeah. Also a precursor to like, I think you should leave Tim Robinson's Netflix show. Yeah. There was some weird elements there, but just totally up my alley. Did you, have you gone back or did you get to watch Upright Citizens Brigade uh, on Comedy Central? I wasn't cool enough to watch it. I don't think even I was allowed to watch Comedy Central as it aired. I'm back probably then dating be- myself because I, <laughs> I was I was plenty old enough to watch it when it aired live. <laughs> yeah, I it, it was hit or miss. Like sometimes I could watch MTV, but like I couldn't watch other things. Or like my parents let me watch Godfather with that. It was just very weird what they pick and chose of what I could see. But I didn't watch it then. I have gone back a few times and and watched bits and pieces of it just to sometimes you just need to like get re-inspired and re-motivated so you go and watch some of the folks that you really look up to and what they did and kind of make yourself feel better about where you're at too um no I've, I've watched it too like the the prostitute barista one was again probably most notable but one of my favorites too it kind of demonstrates her ability to be so multifaceted. I don't think that some of that content <laughs> stands the test of time. Yeah. Like, I don't think they could not, push yeah. it. But if you just look at it like face value for the time it was in, it was it was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely uh, something that like I compared it to Kids in the Hall, which was a Lorne Michaels produced uh, show, of course. So definitely something that probably would have caught the attention of, of SNL producers and possibly Lorne, uh, her time uh, on mm-hmm. the Upright Citizens Brigade show. That's a tongue twister. Upright Citizens Brigade <laughs> show. Yeah. Side on, note. On I'm, Comedy Central. I'm, side note. I'm really impressed that you know what Kids in the Hall is. Oh, God. No. Okay. I, I watched Kids in the Hall. I was a weird eight-year-old. Okay. <laughs> Watching Kids in the Hall. So I would watch SNL in the early 90s so again dating myself but so i i was i was probably watching snl as it was airing probably around 1990 91 Mm -hmm. and after snl finished they would show kids in the hall so so yeah so we if i was able to stay awake by then i would maybe catch some kids in the hall of course i watched kids in the hall and comedy central when i was like in middle school Mm -hmm. high school so that's yeah. I, I don't know. Just he, probably SNL viewers of my uh, age and generation also love Kids in the Hall. You you know uh, before the show, just for context for listeners, we were talking about Sterling Heights, Michigan, and how very niche it was. But Kevin McDonald of Kids in the Hall did workshops at Go Comedy Improv Theater in Ferndale, Michigan. So really, Kevin? that was yes, it was oh. very cool. Yeah, and. Again, also like didn't realize that a lot of people knew what Kids in the Hall is, but because usually you mention it, people are like, "What are you talking about?" Oh yeah, so, I yeah. The Kids in the Hall theme song was my alarm uh, on my my phone for years. <laughs> I think I maybe changed it last year, but the but the Kids in the Hall theme song was was my alarm that I woke up to for like year like a decade. <laughs> That's awesome. So, yeah, you're talking to a huge fan right there. And it's a huge compliment to Amy that I would compare some of her work before SNL to Kids in the Hall, a show that I love just so dearly. So we talked about her her background before SNL, uh, flexing her muscles, already doing a lot in the sketch uh, comedy world. So she was on SNL from 2001 to 2009. She debuted during a tense and confusing time in the country mm-hmm. and at SNL. So in her book, Yes, Please, which I highly recommend, since we're recommending books on this episode, 
I recommend <laughs> Yes, Please uh, by Amy Poehler. So she talked about how difficult it was to start SNL right after 9-11 because of the mood of the country. Uh, she wasn't sure if people were ready to smile, much less laugh, which is something that I remember uh, as well. That was just kind of the mood of the country in general. So as right. far as her SNL stuff goes, what stood out to you about Amy uh, as a sketch performer? So I know that a lot of the SNL performers and, and cast members are able to take, you know, an ordinary thing and kind of exaggerate it. But I think what stood out about her is how she was able to do it. And she, I think a lot of her stuff, uh, what's the, what's the, like, what's, how do I phrase it? It was simple yet like punchy, you know, like she didn't have to do a lot to get her point across. And um, we're going to talk about a few of these characters, you know, coming down, but she was able to take something so ordinary and mundane and turn it into something wild and funny and, you know, provide a different outlook. And, you know, she, as, as a woman, and especially as a woman in comedy, she was able to be a, f like a full on feminist and kind of push through barriers. Not that she is the first to do it and not that she perfected it, but again, for someone in my generation looking up to folks, she was right there after, you know, especially after the internet. And I think she was ahead of her time too on some topics. Uh, I could talk about her pre SNL days forever, but she did, which I'm going to go back to really quickly here. She did a pilot, I think with SNL slash IO called RVTV with Del Close. You should, it's on, it's on YouTube. And, um, you know, she has a line in there where she kind of calls out the establishment and she calls out the NRA and she goes, it's cool to be a Republican. Guns are cool. So is the NRA. Murder is hip. Like, she already had, she knew before we knew and she brought that perspective to SNL and to all of her, her comedy really. And so that to me, while it's general that her POV is what stood out to me in her characters and, and what she wrote and how she performed them. Yeah. I think you brought up a good point. I think she had like an economy of words. She mm -hmm. didn't like, like it was just, just, just little punchy kind of things. We would see a lot of that on weekend update, a lot of that on her UCB show on comedy central, uh, mm -hmm. I, I can tell just kind of going through the previous seasons, which I did recently, it was like, oh, this is, this is Amy. And I think Victoria, you brought up just what I, I didn't even consciously, I guess, think that as far as Amy goes, like, why did, why is she so appealing to me? Why is, why, why do like when she was on weekend update, like, why do I find her jokes more satisfying <laughs> than like Seth Meyers jokes? And I like Seth Meyers, but there's mm -hmm. a reason why I liked Amy's jokes maybe a little bit more and I, and you I think what you said perfectly encapsulates that. I mean in a word she was fearless. Yeah. She really like she did her thing and I don't think she let much get in the way of her, you know, getting her point across and how she felt about things. It was always her point of view which is what we need. We can't just have a shared point of view which in some cases yes, but when she came you know to the writers room or to the screen she was uniquely always herself, which was brilliant. Yeah. And with, with packed with a lot of confidence too. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing you can have a message and you can, you can have ideas and what you think is a point of view, but I think you need to also really relay that with confidence. And, and Amy had that in droves. She was super yes. confident, which is inspiring. I mean, we, um, we being me, like, I'm going to bring my perspective as as a woman, especially as a, a minority in comedy. Like we didn't have a lot of that, you know, on TV where a woman is outspoken. Uh, like some of her character, a lot of her characters are outspoken, and they weren't really as shy or reserved. She was up and center, and you know, really didn't care what people had to say. And it's it's inspiring to me to kind of bring that to the table too. And, and it's allowed me to also in my comedy to be fake confident, you know, fake it till you make it. But <laughs> yeah, she's, she's awesome in that way. Yeah. So as far as specific characters and sketches from her time at SNL, where should we start? <sighs> my goodness. That's a loaded question. <laughs> uh, I think the most obvious is probably like, what, do you think Hillary Clinton? It has been such an honor to serve you, the citizens of my home state of New York. <laughs> oh, am I kidding? This is 
not my home state. It never was my home state. Pack up the house in Chappaqua, Bill. What's that? We never unpacked even better. <laughs> yeah, that was one of her first uh, recurring characters, especially. Mm -hmm. she, uh, she started that in her third season. So her depiction of Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. So we, we talked about what Amy brought to the table as a sketch performer. You saw mm -hmm. some of that in her depiction of Hillary Clinton? Yes, she played, of course, an exaggerated caricature of, of Hillary Clinton. But get, again, it was this fearless, confident, you know, I'm calling out the sexism in politics. You know, I'm calling out how insane, like, especially with her, you know, with, uh, with Tina Fey as Sarah Palin, calling out how kind of ludicrous it is that Sarah Palin has gotten a well in 2008 got a little bit further in politics than she did. And, you know, uh, she brought her personality to Hillary Clinton and, you know, made it, made it really funny. Yeah. And as far as doing impressions and everything like that, I'm preaching to the choir probably here, but there, you got to <laughs> find that hook, right. Mm -hmm. As a performer. Uh, mm -hmm. and I've heard, I've heard some of the masters like Daryl Hammond, uh, Dana Carvey love they love talking about how they conjure up impressions, but you have to find that hook. And I think with her Hillary Clinton, with Amy Poehler's Hillary Clinton, she started yeah. you know her mannerisms that laugh because Hil yes. Hillary didn't really laugh like that to be no. honest with you. But it was something that Amy was able to grab onto and say this is an element of this character that I'm creating, and yeah. let's work from there. Yeah, that's funny that you mentioned that because when she was with Hillary, which is, I think it was March, March 1st, 2008. I think I forgot what season that was, but she does a cold open with Hillary Clinton and Hillary Clinton asks her, I don't laugh like that, do I? And she goes, well, like, yeah, yeah. You know, it was, it was just very funny that she, you get to call out impressions of yourself. You don't really see that. And then of course, in a cold open, which is even more rare and second, uh, not second city Saturday night live. So, I mean, it's just iconic. She's done things that others have never done on that show. Yeah. And she played Hillary Clinton 13 times, uh, throughout yeah. the years from season 29 all the way up to her last season. It was season 34. So she played mm -hmm. Hillary Clinton, uh, quite a few times. Uh, one of the sketches, uh, and I don't know if you remember this one, but it's, it's what I kind of go back to as far as, when Amy first announced herself with confidence, something that she first led, it was in her mm -hmm. second episode. And it's, it's a sketch that she wrote with Sean William Scott. It was the porn star sketch. Hey, can I ask you a question? You can ask me anything. You know that. When do you think it's a good time to mention in a relationship that you've done some porn? <laughs> what? Like in a relationship, you should wait before you tell somebody you did a little porn. <laughs> like, first of all, what an era! <laughs> like, yeah. It was, it was again right after, um, you know, September 11th, unfortunately. But like those, the like, early 2000s, like when it comes to comedy, were so out there. It was, it was, it was, it was almost was... the Wild West. Yeah. yeah, yeah. People were taking chances. It was, unf I mean, some of the bad stuff was like it was. I think it was the height of like Edge Lord kind of comedy. Yeah, which yeah. wasn't so wonderful. But then, but mm -hmm. you also had people taking chances and delving into right. ideas that 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 maybe are taboo or risque. Yeah, I mean, Sean William Scott himself was in what American Pie. American Pie. Like again, wouldn't go so well if it was released as is for the first time today. But yeah, I mean, just having him there and then, you know, having her, like I said, she takes simple things, which I guess being a porn star dating is uh, something you don't usually see, but it's a simple thing. She and takes it happens her, every day, right? Yeah. I mean, it, happens it is a every slice day. of life. Yeah. And it's a different POV. We mm -hmm. don't usually see that POV, but you know, uh, I love that she was like downplaying, you know, I was I was in a porn movie and he's like, well, I don't care about your past. Just like, well, this afternoon, I guess, was my past. It, and then, you know, it was just very funny. I think, uh, again, really cool that she got to be she was fresh to SNL in the second episode, got to be in got to be a main character with the host her second episode. It just 
I don't know, man, do I, <laughs> I'm preaching, I'm also preaching to the <laughs> choir, but like she is doing things that are essentially un, unheard of in, at SNL. Yeah, and, that uh, soon. Yeah, that soon. And it's yeah. your own sketch that you have co-written. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if you wanted to walk through, I guess, how it how it went for the rest of folks, I don't want to ruin it for you if that's where you're going. Oh, no. Yeah, go ahead. No. So, I mean, she's, you know, having, I forgot, is it dinner with a boyfriend or it's like, yeah. And she was or ah. just like, it seemed like a they've maybe a first date or they were in the early stages of dating. Yes. Yeah early stages of dating. She's like, Oh, when is it a good time to mention that I've done a porn movie? And he was like, what? And then, you know, she's like, Oh, it's a, she kind of does like, Oh, it was like a one-time thing, but she's been in multiple. And, uh, he finds out, he's like, Oh, it's your past. And she's like, well, this afternoon, I guess is my past. Definitely. And yeah, he's like, I thought, I thought it'd be cool to date a porn star, but it's now that I am, it's not fun. She goes, I'm not a porn star yet. And <laughs> I think she crossed her fingers too. Or something yeah. like she had the, yeah. the, the mannerisms, like I'm not a porn star yet. Like, yes, um, I might be. Yeah. Hopefully. And you know what? Soon. And you know what? If that's how you want to get your bag, get your bag. Yeah. <laughs> like not shaming yeah. women for their choices. And then of course, Seth Meyers, who like, I think was probably her top collaborator throughout her time at SNL, you know, comes in as, the waiter he's like oh i think i know you from somewhere and then it turns out he casted one of her movies and then he goes and rushes to the uh kitchen to tell his friends and then at the end of it she's signing autographs so and you know josh aka sean william scott is just at the end i guess accepting of her of her career yeah, and I'm sure viewers at the time who knew Amy from her Comedy Central days were mm-hmm. waiting for some kind of showcase uh, like yeah. that, and it came and it came really soon. So, so uh, yeah. she does cite that in her book too, is just something that, like, of, of course, was one of the more memorable experiences for her uh, on the time uh, from her time at the show. So, so that was yeah. like her f- f- the f- one of basically the first Amy Poehler led sketch. Uh, on mm-hmm. SNL that was from season 27 episode 2 uh yes. Sean William Scott go check that out I think it's a fun episode uh just kind of overall um but that I think and I think this porn star sketch I call it porn it's like porn star date sketch uh, yeah. I think it was like a 10 to 1 so I think they kind of just put it at the end of the show so yes uh, and, and it, it yeah. fit perfectly yeah so I'm glad I'm glad it made air I will I will plug Peacock it's on Peacock mm-hmm. if you want to watch it so I think mostly everything is on Peacock, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So sometimes when you get to seasons like 30, 31 or so, mm-hmm. uh, you, you find like 15 minute episodes <laughs> on, yeah. on Peacock. But I think season 27, <laughs> right. we're still, at, you can find mostly full episodes. Most of, yeah. So go yeah. check that out. If you're looking for musical performances, I think they cut a lot of those out. But but other than that, yes. if you, Michael Jordan episodes on there, so just Go for it and watch great. it. Another great episode as well. Yeah. And uh, the LeBron day. James episodes <laughs> on there too. Just if you're if you're uh, more of a LeBron person. Oh, you can't say that to me. I'm I literally oh, live in Chicago. I know. <laughs> Was born in the nineties, lived in Chicago during Michael Jordan's era. What are you I doing? Got it. Just I kidding. Got it. I like both. So, <laughs> so that, uh, we'll we'll start a different podcast about that. Um, so uh, what other uh sketches or characters um could we not uh do the show without talking about bronx beat bronx beat amy poehler and maya rudolph just great chemistry yeah they were like i'm surprised it was bronx i mean bronx i don't listen i don't want to offend culture here i don't know if it's a bronx or staten island i i didn't realize that it was Bronx. I thought it was like the Italians were in Staten Island. Uh, but again, I I don't want to be wrong. I don't want to offend any New Yorkers. I'm ignorant. Ignore me. But I really loved it. They were like these disgusted, outspoken, sassy women. Let me ask you something, Frank. You married? Well, I have a girlfriend. Why haven't you asked your girlfriend to marry you? You know what? Don't get married. Okay. Listen to us. Don't get married. The minute you get married, your life is over. Over. She is right. You know what? My husband, I want to kill him. I want to strangle him while he's asleep. I want to kill him. But you know what? I love him. <laughs> he's loving my life. Oh, here we go with the waterworks. He gave me my two daughters. What am I going to do? So emotional these days. It's true. I can't help it. He gave me my two daughters. I would die without him. You know what, Frank? Do whatever you want. Do what whatever. am I, an expert? Ugh. Who, like, fawned over male guests and would flirt with them. There was a line, I don't know if I'm allowed to 
say on this podcast. Go ahead and say it, and if I feel I need to cut it, I will. (laughs) Okay. She, uh, Amy Poehler, it was with Jake Gyllenhaal, I believe. Was it Jake? No, it was with um, Justin Timberlake and Andy Samberg. And she goes, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go home. (laughs) I'm going to go home, put my phone on vibrate, and call myself. (laughs) (laughs) Like... So gross, but like so funny. Like again, kind of talking about that confidence and that fearlessness in all of her characters. Like I, I, I don't know that I'd be ever confident enough to say that. And then she's like, "Now leave before I change my mind." Uh, <laughs> A total Amy just, Poehler. Just we were talking about how confident she is, and th- these characters, both the 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 characters that both she and Maya played in these sketches, were mm-hmm. sassy, aggressive. Just shameless, shameless. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Just and they played against uh, most of the uh, male. It was usually a host that would come in. Yeah. They were shy and just trying to you could tell they were maybe interns on their show, just trying to learn the ropes or whatever guests who were kind of mm-hmm. shy. So they played really well off of these sassy, aggressive women. So I think perfect. Amy was like one of the perfect people to play this. Yeah, I think the most, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, I would think the most notable and beloved uh, sketch of that is with Katy Perry, mm-hmm. where she comes in in that Elmo t-shirt, and they're like, whoa, 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 you know, like, you know, today's today's episode is brought to you by the number 38 and the letter double D, and <laughs> just like very funny, and she was in, but also very empowering for women, this, this feminist POV comes in, she goes, they go, never be embarrassed by your body. Never, ever. And yeah. so it just, yeah, it was very funny. Yeah. Betty Caruso has a piece of my heart. She's uh, America's America's mom. Uh, it's just wonderful. <laughs> yeah. And the, and it seemed like this Bronx Beat show for these characters was like their outlet. Because they, mm-hmm. they do allude to their, just their moms and their uh, they have families at home. So it almost seems like this is their outlet just to kind yeah. of say what they want and flirt. <laughs> with who they want yeah. so yeah, yeah the bronx beat we don't have to tell our, our listeners to i'm sure they've checked this out so many times definitely mm-hmm. as far as amy poehler goes uh, part of her canon uh for sure yeah. so and what one uh, another recurring character that we're volleying over volleying over here so another mm-hmm. recurring, recurring character that i want to mention is caitlin wedding and i know that you told me it was too early to put my dress on but as co-junior bridesmaid i really feel like i need to walk around and practice in my dress with the heels and the head thing and i'll be like God. Which uh, <laughs> and Amy says this character it was the it was the hyper child um, yeah uh, who hung out with her uncle I think it was usually Horatio Sands was the uncle yeah and Amy says that this character was an homage to Gilda Radner and her Judy uh-huh. Miller character from, from uh-huh. SNL and it's kind of funny when it, like I just had that in my mind that this reminds me of like a Gilda character and Amy yeah. says that it was. Uh, an homage to to that Judy Miller character from Gilda. I didn't so, realize that. Yeah, so we're seeing Gilda's oh. influence to an SNL Hall of yeah. Famer in her own right. She got voted yeah. in. So yeah, we're seeing Gilda's influence. We're seeing Amy. Just I love that she's paying homage to her heroes essentially. And this was a now fun that, character. No, now that you say that, that makes total sense, and it comes out in the mannerisms. I mean, Caitlin is such great birth control. If you're debating whether or not you want kids. <laughs> I just took like, a drink of water. I almost did a spit take. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I just that's when I think of Caitlyn. I think of great birth control. I was like, oh, I don't know if I want kids. Just watch Caitlyn, and yeah. you know, if you're leaning, no, that'll solidify, <laughs> solidify your your decision there. No, I mean she's like annoying kid with braces. I love the one with, um, oh man, he retired. He retired twice. What's his name? Tom Brady. Oh. And, you know, just she puts on a dress. She's just so annoying. She's hyperactive. She's overly annoying. But that's the point. That's the whole point. Yeah. Yeah. And And I usually, yeah, I usually don't love a lot of shouting in sketches. That's why, I don't know. That's why I've had to, I've had to come around on Sarah Sherman. I love Sarah now and I love Mm -hmm. most of her stuff. But a lot, I've had to really come around to her more shouty 
types yeah. of uh, uh, pieces that she does on SNL. Uh, but I still enjoy these Caitlin sketches because of her yeah. interplay with Horatio. And then the character feels fleshed out to me. Mm-hmm. Like there's some yeah. hints for like for a sad home life. <laughs> <laughs> poor so thing yeah she's like always yeah. just kind of hints at that that she has a really sad home life i think the best characters no matter if it's saturday night live or key and peel or whatever it is always have a fleshed out pov and you can tell exactly who they are where they came from you can visualize their life outside of this scene that you're mm-hmm. seeing i think those are always make for the best characters you don't really have to guess who they are outside of the scene i think that was caitlin and i i agree the shouty stuff is hard for me too and i agree with you with sarah sherman i think she's funny yeah and i think what she does is so unique and so niche this is sarah sherman we're talking about but yeah, no, those those louder ones are take a little bit more time for me to warm up to them, but I eventually do. And mm-hmm. I think this was, at that time, one of the few that were, so it worked because it wasn't constant. I don't think they've ever done constant shouting characters or something like that. I could be wrong, but I think it worked for her time there. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I think part of her character, which I find funny... And it's, you know, hinting at how she is outside of the sketch is like her references are old. So she Mm -hmm. referenced like Dennis Leary, like what little kid references (laughs) Dennis Leary or Amadeus, the the movie Amadeus. And it tells me that maybe and this was probably by design by the writers Mm -hmm. and Amy for this character. It tells me that 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 Caitlin grew up being babysat by the TV and she probably watched a, a lot of adult mm-hmm. content that she shouldn't have been and not in a, not like <laughs> sex and violence but just adult stuff like yeah. like like th- that's how I was when I was a kid and yeah like I said I'm not talking about like when I was a kid I would watch movies with nudity I would watch movies right. that had like themes of divorce and like yeah. finding yourself Serious in midlife subjects. crisis and I was like 7 years old Sitting, mm-hmm. l- sitting in front of the TV eating Cocoa Puffs, just in my pajamas watching like Kramer versus Kramer. <laughs> like, yeah, and I kind of think that's how Caitlin was with with her I, Amadeus and Dennis Leary types of references. I wonder if her reference to Dennis Leary was kind of an homage to her Massachusetts upbringing as well, since they're both from Massachusetts. That's a good point. I, I'm going to go ahead and say it was. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how close. I think she's from Newton. He's from... Worcester, Worcester. I don't Worcester. know. I don't know. How- you're Worcester, not a mass. What- you're not a person from Massachusetts, apparently. Worcester. I am a Midwestern <laughs> gal through and through, from Chicago and Detroit. I call myself a chai Troider. Don't uh, let somebody from Massachusetts hear you pronounce it Worcester. Okay, listen. I'm saving I love you right now. Okay. I love Duncan. Uh, I love Winter. Uh, I love. Oh, I love the movie. Um. Fever pitch. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. With and Jimmy all, Fallon. All forgiven. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Sorry to the sorry to the Massachusetts community. <laughs> so you can't I, see my so face. I brought up Caitlin. So I believe yes. I believe it's your turn. Um what yeah, what character or sketch kind of stands out to you? Do we want to talk about the needlers? We can talk about the needlers. Does everyone know what they're getting? Yeah, I think I'm gonna get this beet salad. What? The beet salad. Bee salad? Beet salad. Well, the first two times you said bee salad. <laughs> yeah, honey, I have a real craving for putting some bees in my mouth. <laughs> I mean, we all know that couple in real life. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I think that they perhaps saw those sketches back in, like, what, 2005? And copy them on purpose just to make all of us sad and mad. Yeah. Just to make everybody yeah. uncomfortable for their own amusement. Yeah. It was just, it was very like toxic. <laughs> like that, the kids today would call that relationship toxic. I think, I don't know, maybe you know this. I have a, I have a question because I don't know everything about SNL. Was there a previous version of that called Dan and Sally Harrison, the couple that should be divorced? Yeah, so that was the first the- sketch. Uh, they were called Sally and Dan Harrison, the couple yes. that should be divorced. I think they had a theme song. You're the thorn in my side. You're the face that makes me angry. 
Nothing you ever say or do is right. Sally and Dan Harrison, the couple that should be divorced. In SNL canon, I consider that the first Needler sketch was that Sally okay. and Dan Harrison. I think their names are Sally and Dan Needler, possibly, uh, going forward. Yeah. So they changed the last name from Harrison to Needler, which, of course, they're needling each other. So there's a, a bit on the nose, but yeah, uh, <laughs> but you want a memorable yeah. character. Sometimes it's it's on the nose. But yeah, we all know that couple. Uh, yeah. I don't know why I wrote that down when you said it. I like wrote it down in my notes. As if I'm going to have to like retain that for a later day. <laughs> you might. You might be on I, some SNL trivia show and maybe. it might come up. So Maybe that's <laughs> like if I ever get to audition, they're like, hey, what was the first Needler sketch? I'm going to have to know it. Most people don't know <laughs> that if you audition for SNL, there's a written test to go along yeah. with it. We don't. We hear stories about what it's like to be up there, not getting laughs <laughs> and still doing right. your thing. But then what we don't know is that there's a written test. Born Michaels is the proctor for the test and he's walking around. So <laughs> this might be on SNL's written test, Victoria. Okay, that's so good to know. I'm gonna also, after this goes live, download it and like memorize everything we've said word for word, just in case. Yeah, it's just, yeah, just commit it, commit it to memory. And so this yeah. sketch, I love that you brought it up because Amy and Seth, they go from aggressive to passive aggressive just in an instant. And they have yes. really, really good chemistry here that which we've seen yeah. a lot throughout, uh, throughout SNL, throughout yeah, them in they're, particular. They're a great duo. Uh, I, I hate always comparing her to Tina Fey, but they're, they were kind of each other's counterparts at the time. But like Tina Fey and Jimmy Fallon, I think, have the same energy as Seth and Amy. They just worked really well together. I think they co-collaborated a lot during, you know, their time in SNL. So you see that, which we'll talk about, hopefully, I mean, which I'm sure we'll talk about later is, you know, we can update and the Needlers and, and other things that they've, you know, written together. It just... They did that so well together. I really couldn't see her doing that sketch with anyone else. Uh, I love the fertility clinic one with Natalie Portman mm -hmm. because it's like it describes those, quote, toxic, end quote, couples so perfectly where they're fighting all the time and then they end up like doing it. <laughs> like they were doing it in the in the waiting room and Jason Sudeikis comes in. He's like, I don't think we'll have any more patients for the day. And she's like, why is that? He goes, they're doing it <laughs> yeah of course that's like often the the button to those sketches the first one johnny knoxville is the one yes. that walks in on them and yeah that's yeah. just perfect and that's that's how it is with those couples it's so intense and passionate mm -hmm. and it's in passion it's passionate negatively and sometimes passionate yes. very positively yeah oh that's maybe a good word passionate Passion. versus toxic and, and that's what those couples <laughs> will tell you we're not toxic we're just passionate yeah, you just, you don't know him like I know him. Like, exactly. Okay, okay. Yeah, like they're like little lines of like, oh, we're late because he thought it was better to take the back roads instead of oh the highway, and then they were at dinner and she's like, oh, bee salad, bee salad. He's like, beet salad. Yeah, because I wanted a bunch of bees in my mouth. Uh, just like very, like we know those couples, unfortunately. <laughs> and if you think you're in that couple now and you're listening, please break up and find peace. Please do everybody yeah. a favor. <laughs> For the sake of society. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. So yeah, you brought up Weekend Update. So I want to talk about that yes. now, actually. Good segue. So she yeah. started Weekend Update in her fourth season. So she did it mm -hmm. season 30 to season 34 Final update was in the middle of season 34. Mm -hmm. uh, so what did you, and I know they say comparison is the thief of joy, but that's almost kind of what we do here. Even if we mm -hmm. don't do it overtly, it's almost yeah. implied that we're comparing cast members and eras and all of that. So, I mean, what did you think uh, of Amy on Weekend Update? A force to be reckoned with. You know, she was part of the first and only female duo to host Week and Update with Tina Fey. Uh, then, of course, she had a successful run with Seth Meyers. And she's just had, like, really great bits. You know, uh, one that stands out to me was, you know, her and Tina Fey mentoring Lindsay Lohan at the time, who was, like, that was such a great Mean Girls era. And, you know, for folks who are younger, like, millennials, I should say, that was kind of, like, our 
like the comedy growing up was, you know, Mean Girls and, and, you know, the Tina Fey and Amy Poehler's growing up. So it was really awesome. You know, it was very like confronting her about rumors they've heard about her, which like at the time everyone had a rumor. It was very, I think as a society, we've done a little bit better, not too much better, but we've progressed a little bit how we treat women and people who are famous, but just like saying, you know, you have Misha Barton arms, you're too skinny. Are you eating? Are you going to the club? And then the fun part the, you know, the twist of Lindsay Lohan throwing it back on them. She's like, well, you s- slept with people for to get to movies or, you know, you're drunk right now. And Amy Poehler's like, yes, I am. Uh, no, I mean, she was great. She brought a lot of originality to it. Again, it's that POV of, I am myself, I am me, I'm fearless, I'm confident, uh, and you better listen to me, and this is what I've got to say. She brought that there, too. Yeah, Amy on Update, to me, that really allowed her to display her wit and charm on the mm-hmm. show. She was yes. out of character, well, kind of out of character, but it was, you right. know, she she straddled the line as Weekend Update anchors do, but she really was allowed to display her wit and charm. She did like playful crowd work in Mm -hmm. spots that was really entertaining. She and Tina did a lot of bits amongst themselves outside of the update jokes. Like you mentioned that Lindsay Lohan mentorship bit, uh, they, they they would rap, they, they would sing songs. They would have bits like the, the Nutbird news quiz, the bitch fight (laughs) news quiz, (laughs) kind of different things like that. So I like that she and Tina, went outside of we're just going to take turns doing jokes and then have mm-hmm. like a um, cast member do a week a bit with us or whatever. Like they would do bits amongst themselves, which I think yeah. really interesting. Yeah. I mean, out of the raps, which was your favorite? Oh, man. Um, Not to put you on the spot. Yeah, they did one. It was either the one that I remember most. And I, I went back and rewatched kind of um, – her weekend update stuff here and there. And the one that always st- stood in my mind was, uh, I ended, it ended up being the first one that she did in, in uh, in season 30. And that, and, and that st- stood out to me to watching it in sequential order, because that was one of the first kind of bits that they did outside of the update joke. So, so yeah. you never really saw like Kevin Neal in, rapping or oh, <laughs> nor mcdonald or like uh, chevy chase yeah <laughs> yeah jane um, and, and bill murray <laughs> rapping together so yeah right. so so I, I did like that first one because i maybe it was just because of the significance as as a viewer watching it how i did uh but that yeah. one uh, for sure stood out to me and I, i'd be remiss if i didn't give jane Curtin a shout out for being the first female weekend mm-hmm. host but no the one that stood out to me raps wise is the Sarah Palin rap. I don't know if you remember that. My name is Sarah Palin. You all know me. Vice President nominee of the GOP. Gonna need your vote in the next election. Can I get a what what from the senior section? McCain got experience. McCain got style. But don't let him freak you out when he tries to smile. Cause that smile be creepy. But when I'm VP, all the leaders in the world gonna finally meet me. How's it go, Eskimo? Eskimo. Tell me, tell me what you know, Eskimo. You feel Eskimo. Again, like that era of SNL, like 2000, like the 2008 election specifically, it was so awesome to see the actual candidates come onto that show. I think now people would be like, uh, we are in such a crisis. What are you doing on SNL situation? So it's cool that we got that from then while we, while we could. And, you know, Sarah Palin joins the weekend update desk and then kind of like Amy Poehler kind of brings, brings the house down with a rap about, you know, about Sarah Palin, like delivering her message and then Andy Samberg and Fred Armisen as her backup, just really cool with like the fur yeah. coats and, yeah. you know, yeah, that was one that stood out to me. I, she just, man, again, she's in a lot of things on that show that not many people got to do. I mean, I think, I don't know if we're going to end with uh, a, why she deserves to be in the hall of fame, but yeah. she was, we'll, we'll get to it, but I, yeah, to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll get to it. So I'll, I'll leave my the rest of my thoughts there. I'll pause them for now. Yeah. So before we move on to what maybe she did after SNL and to your uh, appeal to the voters, uh, what <laughs> else on SNL should we talk about as far as Amy Poehler goes? 
I would just love to give a quick honorable mention to two sketches. Again, also in a in the 2008-ish, you know, near the end of her time, is the Bush twin secret language sketch. Jenna, we're twins. We have to share our most secret thoughts about everything. <gasps> well, it's disrespectful. Just answer me in our secret twin language. <laughs> Barbara, we haven't used that language since we were like 19. <laughs> Do be you be think be dads be good be president. <laughs> but yes, I be think but he's be really be good. Like, so funny. I, there was like, you know, they slapped on some southern accents and they were drunk and, you know, they were using their the secret language to figure out i'm trying to do it to yeah. figure out like if their dad is actually like smart enough and competent enough to be president which like was funny because i guess at the time the rest of america was like what <laughs> uh is is he uh and then another one was to love honor and stock with john mccain hello gillian ah! I missed you ah! what are you doing here the conference was cut short so i rushed back to see you david you shouldn't sneak up on people like that. You scared me half to death. Forgive me, darling. You know I'd never hurt you. That was so funny. It was just like her hus her older husband, who was like very in love with her, invades her privacy. And she's just like, he's always in my space and like tries to sue him. And so like, you're literally married. Like <laughs> she's just describing a marriage, basically. Yeah, he's like, yeah. he's just supposed like, and it's like kind of funny because it's like they also bring up again this feminism feminist point of view of like if you were if it was roles reverse it would be a big deal like we'd all be like you know leave him alone if she was the one doing it to him but yeah i think the amount of times she's gotten to play with you know politicians especially during these really important i mean she came during an important time in in the u.s i feel like that kind of set the tone for like what she was gonna do in the years after so i just wanted to give a shout out to those two i now that i'm like we're talking about it she did a lot of a lot of political stuff and yeah. good for her i mean yeah. she's involved politically in her personal life so it just makes sense that she again is enough is is authentic and genuine and stays true to herself even when she's being someone else yeah, and I don't know if those Lifetime movies exist in that fashion anymore, but that was such a yeah. good parody of a Lifetime movie from that era. Yes. So that yeah. uh, To Love, Honor, and Stock, uh, the, the Jillian Woodward story, that's what that was called. It was in her second season, so that would mm -hmm. have been about 2000, late 2002 when that yes. sketch aired. And that was just such a perfect parody of a Lifetime movie from mm -hmm. that era. They captured it so well. Yeah. And I don't know... If there's anything comparable now, Lifetime, does it exist? I think it I might. Know. But <laughs> I haven't watched a Lifetime movie since like 2006. Yeah. So, so but, so, but uh, <laughs> sorry to if say, you watched in 2006. This is, I'm sure, a uh, yeah. big reason why you appreciate something like that. So, I think those are two excellent choices and really great examples of of her work on SNL. Um, I also highlighted her Dakota Fanning show. That she yes. did three times. That was a good one. She just was <laughs> a hilarious depiction of a precocious young girl. Uh, mm -hmm. Amy Amy played that so well. Yeah, when she had Drew Barrymore, Barrymore on, and Drew Barrymore was playing um, the Abigail Breslin from this, Little Miss yes. Sunshine, and yeah. just yeah, Amy played that so well. How old were you when you first got your when you got your first nomination? And she's like. <laughs> <laughs> Ten. Like, she's I, like oh i didn't know you were that young <laughs> yeah that's so funny that's a that's a good call out that was such a i you know dakota fanning if you're watching this or if you're listening to this and i know that you are i hope you're doing well and i hope that you felt justice was served in your impersonation of you by amy puller because it was done out of love so yeah and i pure yeah, love i think i yeah. think she knows that <laughs> <laughs> so after snl amy poehler her main gig was playing leslie nope in parks and recreation i was mm -hmm. a big fan i imagine you were too victoria is that fair yeah. to say yeah i think it was it just calls out a lot of the nonsense that we may or may not see in in politics but especially you know 
local politics, a lot of like a lot of pop culture and societal phrases that we used to like treat yourself came from that. And uh, it's it's made an impact on on TV and on how we speak to each other. And, you know, you know, again, her and Tina Fey, I think, are probably one of the few who had these successful TV shows after leaving SNL. Not only that, like producing and directing and and writing and being so successful at it and where it's so ingrained into our society. Like another example would be like Bridesmaids, you know, with with Kristen Wiig and how after SNL, you know, she created this really awesome piece of piece of comedy for us to enjoy. And, you know, we like I always say, oh, shit, that is fresh. Uh, I, I pull that from from Bridesmaids, but I always pull like treat yourself. And, uh, you know, it's it's um there are not enough words and uh, maybe they are, but I'm not smart enough to know them. I, I have a limited vocabulary, but she is Amy Poehler is she's not the first to do it. We like we've mentioned Gilda Radner and, you know, we also mentioned Jane Curtin. They're not the first, but they are today's, you know, they stand on shoulders, but us after them are standing on their shoulders too. So, uh, with, with, you know, Parks and Rec, she's opened some other doors and avenues for us to be creative and, uh, you know, freed us a little bit to be open about ourselves and our comedy and how we write and how we look at comedy. So after a very successful run on Parks and Recreation, she returned to SNL, numerous cameos throughout yes. the years, especially at the Weekend Update desk. Her most recent mm-hmm. was uh, this past season, season 48, during the Aubrey Plaza episode. Uh, yeah. She returned as Leslie Nope, which, which <laughs> surprised me. I thought I just thought that was wonderful to see her and Aubrey do their thing on Weekend Update. How does it How does it uh, take to run a federal agency? Well, all you do is you show up every day and you do the job. But I want to pick your brain about this job, oh. about <laughs> this show, because I used to watch this when Seth Meyers did it by himself with no one else. <laughs> look really easy. Yeah, yeah. So you said you were here to talk about the government? Or? Yeah, but quick question. President Biden, when he zoomed in before, could he see me or were the cameras off? I, I think I think he pre-recorded that. Oh. I can't tell you. I prayed for that cameo and the Lord answered my prayers. I was like, even if it's like a split second, please. Like, there's like no way you can't. She was, Aubrey was a page and Amy was on SNL and just like, then they worked on a show together. There's no way that she couldn't. And I was just so happy to see them, see them together. So that, that made me really happy. Yeah, that was wonderful. And Amy's also mm-hmm. returned twice to host. She hosted in September of yep. 2010 and she co-hosted with Tina Fey in December of 2015. Wonderful Iconic. show, classic meet your second wife sketch that just, yes, that's one of the classics from that era. She and yeah. Tina just did a wonderful job co-hosting together. Man, and they they also hosted a bunch of award shows. I think it was Golden Globes that they hosted, right? I always get them mixed up. And they're just they're a, a duo. I'm really I'm hoping to find my my Tina Fey or my Amy Poehler during my time at Second City, and you know follow their footsteps a little bit. Not exactly because I need to forge my own path, but uh, it's always good to have a partner in crime when it comes to these things. And yeah. They've done so well for themselves, but I think Tina Fey recruited Amy Poehler to uh, SNL. So I'm willing to do that for somebody else. Are there any takers? No, I'm kidding. I mean, yes, but I'm not kidding, but I'm kidding. If that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> so Tina Fey is an SNL Hall of Famer. She got, yes. she got voted in. So Rightly you, so. so now's the time, Victoria, uh, mm-hmm. where you tell the listeners and voters why Amy Poehler should be strongly considered for the SNL Hall of Fame? Oh, no pressure for me. I mean, what's why not is the better question. She was promoted from featured player to full cast member in her first season on the show, in her first season on the show, making her the second cast member to ever have that happen to, and the first uh, woman to earn this uh, distinction. Uh, you know, she has worked i mean as we've highlighted many times throughout this show she's worked with various politicians and kind of confronted them in in her own way and uh pulled her own point of view and then even 
outside of SNL, her foundation of being at IO, Second City, UCB, makes her a contender right then and there, even before she starts a show. I don't think people really realize and understand how hard it is to get those accomplishments even before the show. You know, it's incredibly competitive and she is has uniquely stood out in all of that. Not only has she been able to get onto Second City's touring company or, you know, she's worked with Del Close. She's thrived in that and she's blossomed into this really awesome, iconic performer. She's, you know brought these characters who've inspired other characters just as others before have. And um, let's just be honest. She's one of the goats. She is, you know, when it comes to female comedians, she is one of the goats. There is not many like her. If you can find somebody who's not Tina Fey, of course, and that's only because they, you know, came up together, who has accomplished as much as she has, I would like to know. Please call me at, I'm not going to give my phone number out here, but send me a, send me a DM and we'll debate it. But she's, um, she's done a lot of firsts and she will continue to do so. And, uh, you don't find as many folks who are back then who are as unapologetically themselves as, as she's always been. So there's that. Thank you so much to Victoria Franco for pinch hitting here. Uh, it was great to have her on the show. I look forward to hearing her again. Uh, what do you think of her argument uh, that she laid down for Tina Fey? A, a goat, she said. She said a goat. I can't disagree. As uh, you know, one of the I like I, I feel like she's one of the. This is an AEW reference, a wrestling reference, but I feel like she's one of the four pillars. Like uh, in terms of fem, you know, in terms of the female side of things, she's one of the four pillars. She's she's potentially on Rushmore, right? Right? Am I wrong? Send me an email, Jamie at snlhof dot com. Would love to hear what you think. Voting begins tomorrow, but before we seal the deal and wrap up this episode, let's listen to a sketch. Uh, this is a, a polar classic. This is a, a Bronx Beat sketch. You'll love it. Let's go to it now. Are we going? Are we, we starting? Going? No one's giving us anything. They're starting. No one's waving. Somebody going to wave us in? Are we going? Uh, no one tells us we're starting. Jenna never tells us we're starting. We're going? We're, we're on. All right. Hello. We're on. Hello. Hello. Welcome to our show. This is Bronx Beat. I'm uh, Betty Caruso. She's Jody Dietz. Hello. <laughs> you know what? I'm already exhausted. Oh, tell me about I'm it. I'm so exhausted. Why do we say we're going to do the show? We don't have time. Tell me about it. I got to take my daughters to school. And the other one with the, the extra class, she's got to be there at 6.30 in the morning. But I don't got enough going on in my mornings like a triathlon with a swimming, running, jumping. What are they, horses? Oh, it's ridiculous. Are they horses and kids? Oh, it's too much. Something else, Enough. Please. No, thank you, really. Seriously. Beat what's, it. What's in the news? Oh, God, the weather here. Oh, it's 70 degrees outside of New York. It's nuts. It's nuts. What is that? What's wrong with it? The whole world's going to blow up, it's I swear. <laughs> my mother gave me the most beautiful leather coat on my birthday. You know how many times I've worn it this year? 0. 0.00. It's bananas. <laughs> Bananas. You know what I say? Live your life because the world's going to blow up. She's right. Enjoy your family. Enjoy your friends. Have a glass of wine. I have two glasses of wine. I have two glasses of wine. What am I kidding? What am I, the police or something? You know what I no. say? Smoke them if you got them. Smoke them if you got them. <laughs> All right. Let's introduce the guests. Oh, God, the guests. I know. Tell me about it. All right. Here we go. Here we go. Buckle up. All right. I can't read this. It's chicken scratch. Who oh, wrote this? It's mine. I'm sorry. I'm a mess. You have terrible penmanship. That's my eyes. Well, you tried the best you can. All right. Here we go. Let's just bring him on. All right? Bring him yeah. on. Yeah. He'll tell us his name. Come on out. Come on out. Come on you. And uh, have a seat. Sit down. Sit down. What's your name? Uh, hello. I'm Frank O'Connor. Oh, oh my God. God. Look at him. He's gorgeous. He's gorgeous. <laughs> So you wrote a book, sweetheart? Yes. <laughs> so adorable. Look, Look at his face. Function. I'm loving his face. His eyes. What are you? What are you, pot Indian? You Cherokee? <laughs> Look at those cheekbones. What are you, Sue? You Sue? Got Sue in you? You, you, you Chippewa? Yeah, you got a little Sue. <laughs> Sue? What are you, Apache? 
You're Mohegan? Mohegan. 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 Yeah, when, when you go uh, gambling, you go to Mohegan or Foxwoods. What are you? <laughs> Tell us. You got a little soup. You got soup in you. You soup. Soup. Well, I'm, I'm Irish Italian. Uh, oh, God. Tempa Tempa. That's a terrible mix. Yeah, not features wise, obviously. Not features wise, not but features temperament. Wise. No, terrible bargain. So, so, tell us what your book is about, sweetheart. Go. Uh, it's a guide to the best mountain biking trails in the United States. Uh huh. <laughs> Let me ask you something, Frank. You married? Well, I have a girlfriend. Why haven't you asked your girlfriend to marry you? You know what? Don't get married. Okay. Listen to us. Don't get married. The minute you get married, your life is over. Over. She is right. You know what? My husband, I want to kill him. I want to strangle him while he's asleep. I want to kill him. But you know what? I love him. <laughs> He's loving my life. Oh, here we go with the waterworks. He gave me my two daughters. What am I going to do? So emotional these days. It's true. I can't help it. He gave me my two daughters. I would die without him. You know what, Frank? Do whatever you want. Do what am I, I, an expert? Oh. She's right. Don't listen to us. We're not the police. So, your book. Uh, you like to ride bikes. Yes. I traveled all over the country and found the best trails and rated them according to difficulty and size. And, uh... Uh-huh. It... You know how many times I had sex last year, Frank? <laughs> 0.002. 0. And it was my choice. This area down here, this area, it's got the Ghostbusters thing over there. No one's allowed in there. No trespassing. No trespassing. Closed for business. You know that red circle thing with the line, the Ghostbusters thing? Yeah. It's my choice. Yeah, you know what? When my husband wants to get sexy, you know what I say to him? Go look at a picture of Angelina Jolie. Oh, take a hike, girl. God, that one. Give me a break. Always talking. So dumb. Oh, I had enough. Oh, God, enough of her. Oh, please. All right, so thank you very much. Thank Good luck with your book, Frank. All Thanks. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye. <laughs> um, okay, uh, thanks. <laughs> Very again. kind of. God bless him. God bless that book. I loved him. He was a tall. All right. Him. Now we have to take a call. How does this oh, work? Please. Oh, please. I have no idea. This thing drives me nuts. It's too God. complex. It's like Starship Enterprise over here. Press that. That right. thing. Here we go. Here you go. Hello. Hello. Caller. Hi, girls. Hi, Dee Dee. Hi, Dee Dee. How cute was he? How cute was he? What? Can you hear us, Dee Dee? God, the speakerphone is junk. <laughs> I'm at the shop right. The lines are huge. Dee Dee, hello. Can you hear us? I can't find one cashew in this whole store. All right. You know what? Hang it up. Okay. Does Ocean Spray have carbs? Jody, hang up. Hang Jody. up. She's, she's gonna stop swearing. Hang up the phone. She drives me nuts. What is she doing? Looking for a cashew. Goodbye, Dee Dee. I'm hanging up. Why is she at Shoprite? I don't know. She drives me nuts. You know who I miss? That kid. Oh, Frankie. Frankie, let's get him back. God, he's adorable. <laughs> where is he? Jenna, where is he? Jenna, where is he? He's in the bathroom. Get him back out here. What is he? The king of England? Knock on the door. Get him back out of the door. Should I bring my book? No, no, no. I just said, honey, you're adorable. Have a seat. <laughs> Look at you. Tell me something, Frankie. What are you, Leo? You're Leo? Aries? Aries? Taurus? Taurus? Uh, you're, a a you're a bull. You're a bull. A, ge a Gemini. Oh, Gemini. Gemini. Oh, boy. Twin, twin, twin. You know what? He's a good boy. You know why? Because he's good to his mother. He's got a nice mother. You love your mother, don't you, Frankie? Look at the mouth. Look at the corner of the mouth. He's adorable. He's adorable. Love so you. Up. All right. Tell us about your book. Mm -hmm. I've been writing for years. By and, the way, uh, did you I... smell that weird smell in the city the other day? Weird. The whole city smelled like garbage. <laughs> What was that? You know what it smelled like? It smelled like a pickle. You know what it smelled like? It smelled like when you cook fish in the house. Oh, you know what? When my husband brings fish home into the house, I say, go have your other wife cook it. Exactly. Go have Angelina Jolie cook it. That one, too, by the you way. Are she's she's nuts. She's absolutely nuts. How old are you? How old are you? Uh, you you know what what I'm a Gemini. A whirling dervish. A whirling dervish, a tour de force performance there from Amy Poehler and, of course, Maya Rudolph. Uh, just a fantastic uh, edition of Bronx Beat. Does it seal the deal for you? I don't know. We're going to have to wait and see. But voting opens tomorrow. Tomorrow. May 23rd. I hope to see all of you registering and letting us know where you're at. That, my friends, is what I've got for you this week in the SNL Hall of Fame. So, on your way out, as you walk past the Weekend Update exhibit, do me a favor and turn out the lights, because the SNL Hall of Fame is now closed. Thanks for listening to the SNL Hall of Fame podcast. Make sure to rate, review, share, and subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on social media at SNLHOF. This is Doug Denant saying, this is Doug Denant saying, see you next week.
Cobra podcasts and such. Oh, 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 O'Reilly. Protect your vehicle's engine with Syntec and O'Reilly Auto Parts. Syntec Premium Full Synthetic Motor Oil is formulated for today's engines to dissipate heat and friction and reduce wear. Get five quarts of Syntec Full Synthetic and a MicroGuard Select filter for just $33.99. Limit supply, see store for details. Get Syntec only at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Oh, 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 O'Reilly Auto Parts.